A question of words. Pushkin, when he read the following lines from an ode of Derjevin's dedicated to Krapovatsky, quote, the satirist may gnaw me for my words, but should praise me for my deeds, end of quote, declared, quote, Derjevin is completely incorrect. The words a poet uses are the essence of his trade, end of quote. And Pushkin was right. The poet, insofar as his profession of words is concerned, ought to be as irreproachable as anyone else in his profession. If the writer should justify himself by circumstances that they are the cause of his insincerity, of his lack of reflection, or of the precipitancy of his words, then any corrupt judge could justify his taking bribes and his trading injustice by blaming his fault on his difficult circumstances, on his wife, on his large family, in short, on anything it is possible for him to allege. Difficult circumstances appear among men suddenly. It does not matter to posterity whose is the fault that the writer said something foolish or absurd or generally expressed himself irreflectively and immaturely. It will not try to make out who jogged his hand, whether it be a myopic friend pushing him to early delivery of his work or a journalist interested only in the profit of his journal. Posterity has no respect either for favoritism or for journalists, nor for his embarrassing position. She gives him the reproof, not they, saying, Why did you not stand your ground? You were sensible of the honor of your rank. It was your idea to prefer it to other more profitable vocations. And you did so not out of some fantasy, but because you heard the divine call within yourself. In addition, you received an intelligence which saw things somewhat further, more largely and more profoundly than those who urge you on. Why were you a child and not a man since you received everything necessary to be a man? In short, any ordinary writer could justify himself by circumstances, but not a Derjavin. He hurt himself a great deal by not burning at least half his odes. That unburned half is indeed striking. Nobody up to now has made such a fool of himself, of the holiness of his own most religious feelings, as has Derjavin in this unfortunate half of his odes. To be precise, it is as though he here tried to paint a caricature of himself. Everything which elsewhere in him is so beautiful, so free, so inwardly penetrated with the strength of his spiritual flame is here cold, soulless, and constrained. And what is worst of all is that here he repeats the name, he repeats the same locutions, the same expressions, and even whole phrases which are so evil-like in his animated odes and which are here simply ridiculous. Like a dwarf who puts on the armor of a giant and furthermore, Puts it on backwards. How many people have now pronounced judgment on Derjavin on the basis of his banal odes? How many have doubted the sincerity of his feelings only because in many passages they found them feebly and soullessly expressed? What ambiguous rumors have been formed on his character, on his spiritual nobility, and even on the incorruptible judgment which he stood for? And all that because he did not burn what he should have given to the flame. Our friend P has the habit of publishing any lines of a well-known writer he may get hold of without considering whether they are to the writer's honor or dishonor. He authorizes it by that well-known stipulation of the journalists. We hope that our readers and posterity will be grateful to us for the communication of these precious lines. Everything of a great man's is worthy of interest, etc., etc. That is all nonsense. A lesser writer would be grateful, but posterity will spit on these precious lines if it already knows what is soullessly repeated in them, if it does not hear in them the holiness of what should be holy. The higher truths are, the more cautious one must be with them. Otherwise they are converted into common things, and common things are not believed. Atheists have not produced so much evil as hypocrites have produced, or even simply those who preached God without being prepared for him, daring pronounce his name with unsanctified lips. The word must be treated honestly. It is the highest gift of God to man. 
It is unfortunate that the writer sometimes pronounces it when he is under the influence of passion, of vexation, of wrath, or of some personal dislike, in short, at moments when his soul has still not achieved harmony. A language loathsome to everyone results, and thus out of the highest desire for good, evil may be produced. Our friend P is a guarantee of this. All his life he has been in a hurry, hastening to share everything with his readers, to report to them everything he has collected without analyzing whether the thought has matured in his own brain so that it could be made closer and more accessible to all. In short, he has displayed himself to his readers in all his sloppiness. And then what? Have his readers noticed the noble and fine transports which often glitter so in him? Have they accepted of him what he wanted to share with them? No. They have noticed in him only sloppiness and untidiness. What a man notices first of all, and they have accepted nothing from him. This man worked for thirty years, busy as an ant, hurrying all his life more quickly to put in the hands of everyone everything that he had found useful for the enlightenment and education of Russians. And not one man said thank you to him. I have not met one grateful youth whom I would say is obliged to him for some new light or a fine aspiration to the good which his words might have inspired. On the contrary, I even had to argue and stand up for the honesty of his intentions, for the sincerity of his words before the very people who it seems should have been able to understand them. It was even difficult for me to convince some, because he so succeeded in masking himself that there is definitely no possibility of showing him as he really is. Let him speak of patriotism. He speaks about it so that his patriotism seems suborned. His love for the Tsar, which he sincerely and sacredly nourishes in his soul. He expresses so that it resembles servility and a kind of mercenary flattery. His sincere, unfeigned annoyance with all tendencies injurious to Russia is expressed in him as though he were sending forth a denunciation of persons known to him alone. In short, at every step he is his own calumniator. It is dangerous for a writer to play with words. May a corrupt word never issue from your lips. If this ought to be applied to each of us without exception, then a hundred times more should it be applied to those whose profession is the word, who are appointed to speak of the beautiful and the sublime. It is bad if on the subject of sacred and sublime things corrupt words begin to be heard. Rather, let corrupt words be heard on corrupt subjects. All great educators imposed a long silence precisely on those people who were verbal masters to no good purpose, precisely when they wanted, above all, to make a show of their words and their souls were dying to say something of much use to the people. They knew how one may dishonor what he is trying to exalt and how at every step our language is our betrayer. Quote, make doors and bars to thy mouth, end of quote, says Jesus the son of Sirach. Quote, Melt down thy gold and silver and make a balance for thy words and a just bridle for thy mouth. End of quote. Ecclesiastes 28 1844